Marketing is hard. We're gonna make it much easier for you today. I've got a special guest, Dave Gerhardt. He's bringing in five important marketing questions from the Exit 5 community. We're going to break down how you solve them, give you some very tactical playbooks for solving them so that you can go and take these and use them in your own business. Let's get into today's show. I'm joined by the one and only Dave Gerhardt who runs Exit 5 Media. He is a CMO, marketing leader, past co-worker of mine, and we are going to dive into some questions, some comments from the marketers that Dave works with over at Exit 5, and we're also going to just talk about some things that we want to talk about today. Dave, welcome. Welcome, my friend. Welcome yeah, to Marketing Against the Grain. Oh, it's so, it's so fun to be here. We had an amazing reaction to having you on the Exit 5 podcast, and so when you asked if I would come on for an episode to co-host... Uh, I was like, yes, instantly, yes. And I love this idea of helping people, kind of doing some half-baked marketing ideas. I got a bunch of questions from Exit 5 members. Yeah, so for everybody watching, the kind of the setup was like, I emailed Dave and I was like, hey, Kieran's out. Come come host with me. And like, I want to know the problems that marketers in your community are having. We're just going to give them some of our off-the-cuff ideas. We're going to brainstorm and we're going to just talk about some different marketing challenges. So I think there's going to be something for anybody to learn from today's show, because we're going to be talking about a lot of common problems that people have. Yeah. And I think, you know, one thing I've always appreciated and just like hang out with you and talking marketing. And I, I talked about this with some people that I work with and I shared some, I got a bunch of notes after you came on our, on our podcast. And I think what I learned when I talked to you and even just watching some of your episodes with Kieran is there is not like, there's not cookie cutter marketing advice and giving marketing no. advice is very challenging because it there's a lot of nuance to it, obviously. Um, but I think you have a way of approaching problems and I like, I like, I, I want to show people how you approach solving marketing problems. And I think now I feel like you could basically serve, serve up any problem and let's figure out how we're going to work backwards and, and, and tackle that. And I think there's a lot of like, totally. just like first principle stuff that I think will be helpful for people. Sweet. Let's do it. All right. Well, we got, what, 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 what did the exit five? All right. This first question, for this us? first question is from Craig and I love okay. this because Craig wrote, I love this crossover. The two most listened podcasts that I have are marketing against the grain and exit five. So that's oh, cool. Shout out to you, Craig. Thank shout you. Shout out to you, Craig. So Craig says, I'm a director of marketing. So you got to pay attention, Kip. I'm going to read this. You got to pay attention. All right. I got I'm you. director of marketing at a seed stage SaaS company, event Vesta. Our tools help event organizers automate and unlock local marketing channels. We have about 600 customers customers from the Dallas Mavericks to the bar down the street. Our pricing is per event, so customers that host many events get more value out of our automation and we earn more revenue from them. Our ACV is $840, but it's been creeping up to $1,200. Here's the challenge. Our budget is tight. <laughs> he wrote that. Uh, it's pretty much my salary plus half time of another team member and about three k per month to spend. So you got two people, half yeah. So one and a half and, and three grand. Right now, we've primarily relied on outbound email because it's been incredibly cheap and worked well for us. See 600 customers. As outbound email is getting more crowded and harder, any ideas on how to transition to a more diversified marketing mix without cutting off the one channel that brings in 90% of our deals? I've got ideas, but would love to have some of your half-baked marketing ideas. Oh, this is a good one. This is a really good one. I like this one. Uh, for, first off, can we just talk, before we talk marketing ideas, Dave, can we just talk a little business strategy with, for, for, our, for our boy Craig here? Yes. The, the charging, like the value per event is tough. That's a tough business model. It doesn't fit super well in a SaaS model. Eventbrite has struggled with this problem its entire existence. So uh, Craig, you and the founding team, I really encourage you to think about pricing and packaging and the leverage that you can have there. Uh, because it sounds like you've got a good product, good product market fit. I think you just need to get the economics better so that you can then, in the future, hopefully get more marketing dollars to spend. And when you, but, when you say when you say pricing per event, so right now their their software is priced like you're going to host one event, you just pay for that one thing. That's what that's what he seems to be implying. Okay, that the people that have more of multiple events like our better customers and pay them more. The challenge with that is that there are a lot of people who only have one off events and there's a, and there are a lot of people who have very infrequent events. So it becomes harder to predict your revenue. The other thing is they don't really have a target buyer yet, right? They the bar down the street to the Dallas Mavericks is like, Whoa, all right, who, who are you making, who are you making this for? And, and part of it is like, we're going to give you some marketing strategy, Craig, but if you can't decide on like, who do we actually serve? 
then all of your marketing is gonna be watered down, right? Because you're not gonna be able to resonate with that target audience like in the deep way that's really gonna work with them. Yeah, so 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 without even talking about marketing, it's like, okay, this is interesting. This is a seed stage SaaS company, so mm -hmm. it's early. Early. The positive signs are like, it's early. They seem to have something that's working. They got customers from, to your point, the Dallas Mavericks to the bar down the street. They've kind of taken this shotgun blast approach. We have customers... But now the business advice would be like, it's not marketing advice, but who, what is our IC? This is the time to start defining like an ICP and exactly. you need something repeatable here, right? As, as an investor or just somebody who's thinking about scaling a repeatable business, th this, this model is not going to be repeatable. Correct. And if you want to raise that A round, you need to get to this repeatability. Part of what's also going to help you get to that A round is also building a scalable go-to-market, right? At $800 to $1,200 annual contract value, for people who are not familiar with the term ACV, annual contract value, what, what we're basically saying is that that's not enough money to like pay a sales rep to sell that thing. So marketing has got to do the heavy lifting for the most part of selling this product. And what we're hearing from Craig Dave is that it's all about outbound email right now and like that's basically what's working from them they've got him half half of another person's time and a couple grand a month right and so, so i i'm going to give you my first take on what i would do this is the first thing hearing this and then i want to i want to riff on it with you the first thing is i'm going to give a controversial thing is like double down on that outbound email and make it super effective like Use an AI model, train that model to get ultra personalized. Like, be clear on how you can, the people that are world class at outbound, they get really good at personalizing the content and they get really good at data scraping and data appending to make sure that they have as much contact around who they are emailing as possible, they, around much context around who they're emailing as possible, so that that message is going to resonate and have a higher conversion rate. So, Given that you have something that works, I think there are paths to make it better because you're early on your seed stage company. You know, the, you, it's not like you've been doing this for a decade and squeezed every benefit out. So yeah, that's I the first I, thing I would say. That's great. I, I actually, I didn't expect you to say that double down on outbound, but it makes a ton of sense. Well, it's their area of strength already. Yeah, it's already working. And so I'll give you, my, my idea is, is kind of very similar to that, but you mentioned let's double down on outbound let's nail personalization, let's nail targeting. Mm -hmm. Well, if we if we rewind all the way back, the, you can't do that unless you have a clear story. And so I would say, let's, let's, re, let's come up with a clear, and now this doesn't have to be, this is where people obsess over this. This does not have to be your forever posi positioning, right? Mm -hmm. I would say like for the next three to six months or for the next quarter, we are going to exclusively focus our efforts on like this one persona and let's go run targeted. Now let's go run targeted outbound campaigns towards those companies. And so I would go dig into those from the Dav from the Dallas Mavericks to the bar down the street. There's got to be a pocket of 20% of those customers who are your best customers. They run multiple events. They're very happy. They tell their friends, find that pocket. Maybe it's only 10 or 20 customers. And can we go, can we go double that and take, take, take Kip's approach to outbound? But now instead of kind of spray and pray outbound, we're going to be super targeted. And we got to work some AI into this. I think there's an incredible opportunity for a small team. You have one full-time person between yes. outbound email and the copy ideas that you can generate with ChatGPT. I would go spend the 900 it's $900 a year to get the pre, the premium version of of ChatGPT. That's They have that in their budget. They have that in their budget and you can get so much strength in that. I Yesterday, I needed to write a video script for a new sales page that we're working on. I just had nothing. I spent basically an hour and a half like massaging ChatGPT to yeah. get something where I want. And then I wrote it in a minute. And I was like, wow, that stuff like that. I think there's there, there's something well, huge well, here with well, copy. Dave, let, let me tell you, I'm going to spoil a little bit of a, of a future show we're going to have from Emmy from my team come on. But we are we are using just the raw open AI API. And we are, are, bas are basically tr have trained... OpenAI through all of our email data and the contact data we have, because the, one of the big challenges we had was, oh, if some if this is somebody's first contact with us, the very first email that we've ever sent to somebody, like how do we know what they want? What is it like an actual good email look like when you don't know anything about that person? So it, we're doing this for inbound, but you could do it do it for outbound as well. And it took us about six to eight weeks to like kind of train and test, but now OpenAI is generating the 
the text and HTML into HubSpot. HubSpot is sending the emails and we're like two to three X better performance wise than our, our previous. And like, that is something a single person can go and do totally. at a small scale, right? Like yeah. that's, that's just one of those, like where focused and investing actually gets you a lot of leverage. And we're going to have me on to break down all the technical sides of it, oh, but I just wait. like, that's a little hat tip to that. And is has that, is that model actually trained on, I was just trying to find this this week. Cause I'm trying to like, I want to figure out how I can get emails to sound like me but the best I can't find a way and I don't I'm, I'm not technical enough but like my experience with chat GPT is I've learned how to write the right prompts that can get me that voice but I didn't know if there's a way to like have it be trained yes ongoing. yeah you can you can basically train it when you're working through the API, API you can do all the training and fine-tuning of chat GPT for that like specific or for the from the open AI API perspective for that specific use case because you're just accessing the model and using that model for a very specific use case versus like chat GPT which is just kind of like the consumer grade uh, version of it two, two follow-ups for you before we, we move on yeah, from Craig go. number one how much does a company goal matter here? Because it's kind of like, okay, you got a tight budget, you you don't really have a niche yet. I've found that like, if you were this, if you're my boss, Kip, the CEO, I'd be like, give me a goal. Like, what are we? We need guardrails here, and I feel like a lot of great marketing happens when you have clear guardrails. Like, let's just go get fifty new customers this quarter. Do you do you kind of get what you get what I'm trying to get uh, at for Craig? Totally, here? because you know, you and I talked a little bit about this on when I came on your show, Dave, which is like. Once you have a goal, you can work backward to know what you actually need to do. And what that normally tells you, what uh, spoiler alert, when you have a goal, that goal is somewhat based in what you're doing today. And so what you'll see is like, oh, 60 to 70% of that goal I can accomplish from the plays I'm already running. And you probably have 20, 30, 40% of that goal where like, I need to go build some new plays. But it actually tells you what those plays might need to be because you'll know, okay, well, I need, you know, a thousand visits a month and I need to convert, you know, you know, a hundred of a uh, hundred of those visits into uh, demos or signups or whatever the like the pre-purchase step is. And then I need to convert, you know, 20 percent of those. Right. And then that gives you the baseline math of, OK, I need to go run an ad playbook, a YouTube playbook, a text based search playbook to go and get them. And so should Craig like if, if they if marketing doesn't know that goal, mm -hmm. do you push on the CEO? Do you say, hey, I need some vision yeah. here? Like. Yeah, the, the CEO should basically say, hey, based on our growth goals, we have to add, you know, 100 customers a month. How are we going to do do that? And the CEO and Craig should be deeply aligned on like, hey, we think we've got a model, a, a basic model here that's going to get us 100 or more customers a month if we go and do the work well. We got a next let's, question. Yeah, let's go to the next guy. Next question is from uh, Pranav. He is a former, former marketing guy, former VP of marketing. He started a new company called Paramark. They do marketing measurement. Um, okay. New, new company, seed, seed-ish stage startup. Um, he says, how do you call out your ICP, which is enterprise, without saying enterprise because that's boring? Enterprise is, is is super boring. First of all, the marketing measurement space is a tough space. So good good on you for for taking it on. I think Dave, you and I have seen countless companies in that space, and it's just a hard space to differentiate in, especially in the enterprise. And I think the last answer, Dave, kind of showcased who you and I were. You went like straight to positioning, and I went straight to like demand generation. Like, how do you act? How do you actually get that? And this is actually a position question, so I'm interested in in your point of view. The core question when you're playing up market, though, is are you playing in an existing category or are you trying to disrupt an existing category mm. uh, would be the first question I ask. It seems like, given that he's branded as marketing analytics, he's currently thinking about playing in an existing cate category. And so then you need things that are going to make you clearly different than the competition, and so if like you're relying on Gartner and a lot of the classic enterprise buying signals, you're going to, it's going to be boring and you're not going to be differentiated, right? Like you're going to need really different and unique customer stories. You're going to, you're going to need interesting details on implementation and time to value and a lot of things that enterprise buyer cares about without calling it enterprise. Mm. One interesting thing that I've struggled with in a, in a past company is, um, Customers don't often say 
enterprise or some do and some don't and some like when you say this is for the enterprise to some customers that means fortune 100 exactly. companies enterprise is the most vague term in business it's it's very challenging and then i also would say your icp so a that's just a vague term in general it, it's honestly i've struggled with this um another example i was cmo at this company called privy and we sold um e-commerce software to small Shopify entrepreneurs. So like people who are doing like a million dollars in revenue or less in sales. And we struggled with what to call that because the technical term is SMBs. So like when we're talking to investors, they're like, oh, this is an SMB business. But none of our customers, most of them didn't think of themselves as small businesses. I'm, I'm not a small business. And so there's always a weird there's this weird thing of like you say small business, mid market, and enterprise internal, external that often means nothing. And so Kip said something interesting there, which I which I would lean on, which is customer stories. I think that yes. people buy people buy products when they say, "Oh, interesting, this company looks like mine. I'm going to use that product." And so if you want to attract enterprise, whatever that means, Pranav, in your world, I would focus on. Let's be really targeted with our customer acquisition. Let's be really targeted with ABM, outbound, whatever we're going to do. Let's go get some of those customers. And then we need to like just turn up the megaphone on telling those stories. And then when you come to our website, maybe hopefully you can profile some of those customers. But even if you can't, I think the use cases, you can use specific language that is very clear that that use case is for a larger organization than a smaller one. I wouldn't obsess over the term enterprise. I would this is basically a show me, don't tell me type of scenario. Well, yeah, and I want to add one other thing that's important. If you look, I know enough about the marketing technology space that if you're selling marketing analytics up market, we will call it up market to, to more established companies, right? Won't call it corporate enterprise and market, what have you. You are selling to essentially a person who runs marketing operations. Like that's largely who you're normally selling to. And those people buy tools that are going to make their careers better, right? They're going to make them look good, that are going to help them have velocity. You've seen a lot of enterprise software companies invest a lot in their admins and core customers to, to do that. And if you're going to succeed in the marketing analytics space, you're going to have to do the same thing. Not only are you going to have to have great customer stories, but you're going to have to create customer champions, the right kind of training certifications, the things that those marketing ops managers, directors, what have you, are going to want to do. And they're going to want to bring in your product because that product's going to help them get promoted. They understand the career benefits, all of those things. And if you don't make that clear to them, then they're just going to go pick somebody else who's going to do that for them. Oh, I like that. Just to riff on that, if I'm yeah. early if I'm early stage, I think based on what I know now, I would go super niche. Like so, focus totally. on one role. Like we are the analytics platform for... VP of marketing for VP of marketing ops at SaaS at B2B SaaS companies in this thing and just just like tell the heck out of those stories because I think a lot of people they're like well we we can do so many the founders have this have this bias and founders are yes. amazing because they can suspend uh, reality right yes. but they're like they always get defensive because well, well, well our product is cannot it doesn't just do that <laughs> it can also do these things for a hundred personas. I'm like, great, go build a hundred million dollar company. And then you can sell yeah. to multiple personas like HubSpot now, you know, now does at, at this level in the, in the billions of revenue range. But right now, the best thing that's going to help you get traction is to be very specific for a specific persona. So I would blow up enterprise and I would go to Kip's point and say, who is that exact person that we're trying to sell to? Let's really nail that yes. person. Let's go find 10 to 20 of those customers. And by the way, when that lands, then you can then easily expand to another persona. With well, because the then you learnings. build the right integrations for them, the right features for them. You have the right messaging for them. And they're so happy that they're going to be the flywheel that helps you expand beyond that. And like, again, the game of a startup is survival, right? Like you can't do everything because you'll die. You know, <laughs> like right. you just won't be for anybody. Well, you have to be for somebody early on. And I also, so you, so you can't do everything because you'll die. But I also... The more that I've seen, I'm sure you see this in all the companies and people you work with, I almost believe that almost everything can work. <laughs> like Exactly. Should, it, well, this, is the, this is the most crazy thing to me, is everybody's out there looking for like this very prescriptive path, 
Every remarkable, there, like if you just go study all the remarkable businesses that have ever been built, there's no clear same path. No. The only clear same path is they had some beliefs that they held true. They, had, they were clear on who their target buyer was eventually. They got there and they relentlessly worked to, sol- to serve their customer. And they normally had some macro market tailwind or wave that they surf that helped them be really big and successful, right? Yeah, I mean, go, but just there's go not back, a clear playbook. Go back to our last example. If, if, you, if I didn't tell you the channel, I said, here's this guy. They're, they're a, he's a director of marketing at a seed stage SaaS company. They do, they're an event marketing tool. The ACV mm-hmm. is $1,200. Um, you'd be like, oh, well, probably content inbound, social media. That's how they're getting most of their customers. Actually, no, they're doing outbound. Okay. Yep. And so it's like, should should you like should you be on YouTube? Should you do TikTok? Should you do ABM direct mail? Yes. The answer is yes. But it's <laughs> any of those things when. can work, but it matters when. To your point. So. Well, and it matters the skills that you have. You can't be an expert in all those things. And to be a good marketer today, you have to be an expert craftsperson in the area of marketing that you're focused in. And so if you're a seed stage marketer, you got to pick one or two things to be really skilled in at the yep. in the early days. All right, Pranav, focus on the focus on the 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 customer, not the not not the name. Um, exactly. All right, Kip, this is a good right, one what's, for what you. We'll get next. I'm gonna dig into your your nurturing. Dig into your mofu days here. My oh, friend, all right. right? Some lead nurturing. This Working question, on topic. maybe, maybe. I don't I, I don't know if I've interpreted okay, this right, see. but this question let's is see. from Brandon Lee. Brandon works at MongoDB. So this is a okay. this business is a hyperscale PLG, aka the company's MongoDB, yep. with millions of active users, but also millions of inactive dormant users. Mm-hmm. We have a sophisticated onboarding onboarding nurture that every user goes through based on individual in product signals. Furthermore, many users kick the tires of the product, but may not actually have a production use case or pain point that they're solving for immediately. Yes. But we do see a small percentage of users come back to the product after months and even years of inactivity. I'm trying to move with this dormant audience that was compelled enough to sign up but not but are not regular users of the product. My question is, what are some re-engagement tactics that you've seen for a dormant audience that could be successful here? Ooh, this is a fun this is a fun question. I love, I really like this one. All right. So if somebody's dormant, right? They once had intent, but they've like clearly disengaged with your product or your service. And so, I think historically what people have done is you know, they try different like content hooks right they like oh well, maybe you care about this part of our product now or i know you're in this role and so because you're in this role this new thing might get you interested and uh get you back into our product and that works a little bit but i don't think it's the best solution the best solution i think here is how do you get the right intent data on your users and intent data means like what are they out there shopping for right now what are they actively researching? What are they trying? And so a lot of intent data providers like G2.com, Sixth Sense, some of those companies would be the path I would go down. I'd be like, cool, how do I then go and get the right intent signal, the why now data basically? Like why would this person be, why should I reach out to this person now? And what should I reach out to them about based on what I know about them? Because we have seen the highest conversion rates always come down to intent data. If you can pick the 20% of the users in a given month that actually have intent and can get them the right message, you will be able to re-engage those dormant users at probably 50, 100% higher of a rate than you're doing right now. So so you're talking about, so intent data from those kind of third-party data providers. Could intent data also be, or is this a different term or is it just another layer? Could intent data also be like recent activity on, on our site? Like someone definitely that's- it could be, it could be, it could be web, web behavior activity on your site. It could even be behavior activity of peers or colleagues at the same company that you're trying, that you basically build a model around and say, Oh, these four people are doing this kind of similar thing. Maybe this other fifth person also needs to do that similar thing. Yeah. And maybe we should try to engage them there. So I'm just wondering if like maybe maybe they've done this. So I don't want to give like obvious advice yeah, here. Yeah, of course, of course. You got millions of dormant users. Kip is pulling on an interesting thread here. It's like, sure, we can reach out to all of them and say something, but can we layer on something? So so let's go try to find which pocket we should go focus on. And so maybe layer on like, okay, let's analyze this data. 
these this group of people have not visited our website in six months, and so there's no chance they're even thinking about us. So exactly, if we want to reach out to them, it's got to be a different message. Verse, let's like try to trim this down. Oh wow, we just found five thousand users who actually have done X, Y, and Z behavior today. So there's got to be some scale, and you're going to have different messages to different audiences. And I would obviously start with the lowest hanging fruit run that analysis and let, let's come up with some, this is like basically lead, lead scoring, right? Let, let's come up with some yes. type of score and figure out who we should go reach out to. And then then you can determine like what what message we're going to reach out with to all these different audiences. And, and there you can also do the converse of this, Dave, which you Ooh. can say, here are my best and most active users. What have they been interested in? How did they come in to discover my product? And can I have my, my dormant users kind of go through that same process? Yeah, It's like, oh, wow, I know these kind of five pieces of content in the front door for my most active users. Oh, maybe I actually try to engage my dormant users to go start that journey and move them through that journey. Both, both strategy, all these strategies will work. You'll have to just try cohorts of each to figure out what's going to be the most uh, fruitful, but all of them are going to give you some leverage. This is an interesting challenge. Like, you know, HubSpot, you you all must have everybody in your system in the world that, that you that you could sell to. No, and, no, I wish. But or or, or Ma- MongoDB. Well, what a, the, the Kip? The point that I'm trying to make is like in the earlier stages of your company, it becomes like, well, we need to go and acquire names, acquire more, right? This is like a different issue. It's like we, yes. we can reach them, but why are they not interested? Do we have the right message? Do we have the right offer? And do you ever wonder though, like how do you decide when to move on from this? Like, is it possible that these people are just never going to be interested? Is that a possibility and you should just not Oh, spend time I, I think it's a high possibility that a high percentage of them are never going to be interested. So you would decide to move on based on the equation you just gave, Dave, right? Like if MongoDB has everybody and they can't go do a bunch of new acquisition of the technical users that use that product, then they've got to squeeze everything out using the playbooks we talked about. If there's still a huge part of the market that they don't have and aren't users aren't engaging with, then I would actually spend some of my time here, but not as much as I would doing brand awareness and demand generation to go bring those new users in. All right, let's move on. Let's move on from Brandon. This question is from Heliana. She is the co-founder and CEO at a company called Video Deck. Video Deck is a video production company for SaaS companies. We grow mostly through outreach, organic search, and referrals. While we do get quite a few referrals from happy clients, I feel like we don't do anything to incentivize them. Question, what are some Mm -hmm. referral program ideas that actually work? What are some ways to incentivize your clients slash relevant connections to recommend you without be too pushy and insulting? I'm going to be really honest. I've had a hard time getting customer referral programs to work. Have you? Have you ever had one work, Dave? It's hard. Like they I mean, no, uh, they worked a little bit, but like he, he, let, let's let me describe the problem statement. See if you agree with it, Dave. Which is like. If your customer referral programs work great for consumer companies because there's an obvious incentive you can give to that consumer. Right. It's much harder when it's a B2B company because they're like, hey, they're doing this for their job. Like they don't like they don't care about the extra 25 bucks, what have you. Normally what they care about, the thing that we found most successful is they care about like special access special swag, like things that make them feel cool and give them identity in the community and amongst their peers. Like those are like the incentives. Cause when you're talking about customer referral programs, incentives are a huge part of it and getting the incentives right are a huge part of it. But I don't know if I, if it's the place I would double down and spend my time. Yeah, I'm, w- I'm with you. I'm with you. I haven't been able to get them work in like this crazy, predictable, repeatable way. Yes. And I found that oftentimes, well, there's kind of like, I guess as the company grows bigger, companies try to do this where the enterprise sales rep like works in a contract, works in a clause into the contract that says like, you'll be a case study or something, right? Mm-hmm. And and that that's different than, uh, that's different than actually having somebody be a referral and recommendation. I do think an underrated strategy is asking. And um, 
I'm always surprised. <laughs> this, is, this is a good one. You know, this might be the most. This might be the most. I'm always surprised when I've asked somebody to to write a recommendation, or even I've just noticed like people who have service providers, agencies, or whatever who have helped me with stuff that I'm building. When they're like, "Hey, you know, it seems like you're super happy with what you're doing. It'd mean a lot to us if you gave us a quick testimonial or referral. Could you just record like a two minute video?" And I'm I'm surprised at how often I say yes to that. If I feel like the intentions are really good and I'm like, you know what? That person was really impressive. They really did help me. Yes, I did pay them money for this task, this this project. But like, I want to see them win. I do feel like there's a pocket of that. And so I feel like just asking and you, I would just ask everybody, ask every happy happy customer. But you're probably selling a service that is, you know, relatively expensive video production is not a not a cheap task i feel like sending someone like a i often see it's like a 25 dollars gift card that stuff doesn't doesn't do it for me and i don't think that's gonna work Uh, so i I think what you are saying is the best advice which is like don't over engineer the program just ask people i think the magic is can you find the right moment to ask can the ask be really simple and can it be automated right like can you pay to just how, there are a bunch of services out there that will send like handwritten notes, right? Can like you pay to like automate at like 15 days after the end of a contract to have that handwritten note go out and just ask for any referrals? Yeah. If you can, you pro- to, to your point, Dave, you're going to get many more than you think. Yes. Okay. I like this. I mean, let's, let's give her some, I, I have an actual specific idea. I think oh, please. one of the things that that people miss here is like they the ask seems too big and so like you, you, if you yes. just email your customers you're like can you refer us you're like well i, I don't know <laughs> when i'm gonna bump into so- sure when i bump into someone who needs video production here's what i would do seems like you you sell to, you sell to SaaS companies there's a lot of linkedin to me is like the this. place to be for this what i would do is i would right now or next week i would write an email i would get a list of all of your happy customers from you the co-founder and ceo and say and i would say hey it's heliana and you could run this against chat gpt you could just copy my words exactly do whatever and i would make the subject line and the subject line would be quick favor question mark hey um you've had a lot of success with us producing videos for you whatever talk about the relationship it would. We're really trying to grow this year, and we have some big goals. Since you're one of our best customers, it would make me so happy if you just went to LinkedIn and just wrote a quick post about how what your experience has been like with us. Here's two examples of things you can write, and here's how to tag us on LinkedIn. Yeah. When I do something like that, I'm always surprised at how many people do that. And then you're you're not asking for like you're just asking for somebody to write a LinkedIn post, which to a lot of people is just a transactional thing. Sure, I have a. I haven't posted anything in a couple of days. I can write that for you on Friday. Totally. I would do something like that. Um, and and then maybe once a quarter, just put that on your calendar as like a recurring invite for to yourself and just be like, send an email and ask for referrals. Another idea you could do is basically do the outreach, whether it be LinkedIn or email or what have you, and just be like, oh, who's your favorite SaaS marketer or, or, or founder that you know? And be like, oh, cool. It's Dave. Well, is it okay if I reach out to Dave and reference the work that we did with you all? Yes. And it's just, and they'll, they'll basically, they'll be like, sure, that's fine. And then you, you, the founder can go and say, Hey, we just did some awesome work with Dave or we just, you know, we just did some awesome work with XYZ company, Dave. And we think we can do the same work for you. Do you want to, do you want to chat, chat about it? And that's, that's like, it's not a full referral, but it's close enough to a referral that you're going to get a much higher booking rate than, just like a cold email. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good one. I've been getting, so I work with this guy, Jordan, from this company, Growth Community. They helped me, basically I moved, I moved Exit 5 uh, last year off of Facebook into Circle and it was just, yeah. it was a huge project and he, he helped me do that. He did an awesome job and he just asked me, can you, could you be a referral for us? And maybe once or twice a month, I get a message on LinkedIn or an email from someone saying like, hey, I'm thinking about working with Jordan. What's your experience with him been? And I'm happy to reply like two sentences. And I'm just like, he's great. If you're thinking about it, do it. And and that's essentially the same thing, but I'm not out there like giving referrals, right? Exactly. So rethink about, uh, our advice is rethink about how you think about what a refer- referral program actually is in B2B. Ask for the referral and then we gave you a couple ways that you could go and ask for it. I think you gave the best one, which is like just don't spend so many cycles trying to like try it and then and then move on, right? Exactly. Uh, the, the fact that you don't have one one big channel that is how you acquire customers is actually my concern. 
find one big channel that you're an expert at that's going to acquire customers. Like our first first question day, it's like they were great at outbound email. Like they needed to diversify, but at least they found something that works. I have yes. a hard time with any company that doesn't have one thing that is far and away the thing that works for them because that means they don't have any like scalable, predictable play yet. All right, I got two more I want to get in. This one's from Felipe. He's a head of marketing. He said, first of all, this is awesome. Second, you, Kip, and Kieran are all marketers that grew a good and specialized audience. They leverage it at their companies. And for what I know, do something on the side as in in advising. Um, You created a business from it. What do you think about... How do you think about the ways that you can leverage this this audience? How did you start something on the side? And did their audience mean something to their companies? Hmm. That's a good question. This is, I mean, this is in my wheelhouse, in your wheelhouse too, Dave, which is like distribution's undefeated. Like if you have an audience that yeah. cares about something, there's always a way to make the financial ramifications work. Always. Well, I, like I think I it's, think that it's the impossible common, for it not to. I, I just think like the common thread, I think people overanalyze like this side thing this audience like we, did we decide totally. to build an audience is like no we were passionate people who are passionate about this the craft mar- uh, the thing that we do which is marketing you see For this sure. in other industries you see this in sales and hr and finance and you know engineering whatever you, you see this everywhere we kind of came up in an era where digital marketing tools were the norm and so and so especially social media and today you have access to all these platforms. You have LinkedIn. You have tech, you have every social media and publishing platform. And so, if you're passionate about the niche in which you work, you can attract opportunities to you by writing about that stuff online. <laughs> it's not <laughs> dissimilar from the inbound marketing methodology no, from from 2006. And so, I think there wasn't some big thought of plan. It's like share this online. I think that's the opportunity that you have. Um, and the advantage is out of a hundred people, not everyone's going to do it. 98, 10, you know, 20 of them are going to roll their eyes at you. Uh, 70 of them are not going to do it. And maybe six to eight of them will. I think that's the opportunity. So I, I, write, writing online is undefeated. Definitely undefeated. The, he, here's what I would tell everybody. Cause this is kind of a, like, I'm going to reinterpret your question. It's like, how do I change my life? I'm doing something that's interesting, but like, I want to like, I want to live a different life. I want to change my life. And there's a couple ways you change your life. First is you believe something that's going to be really important that most other people don't think is important. It's going to be right. And for like Dave and I, that was marketing on the internet a long time ago. Right. And like, wow, it turns out just having conviction on that for a long period of time was pretty life changing. The second thing is find some way to be a leader in that thing that you think is going to be really important. And, you know, like I wrote a blog, I wrote a book, I did, I did all kinds of stuff, but it was always through a lens of, all right, there's some, I I care about this thing. I care about this topic. I'm very passionate about it to Dave's point. There's some skill I want to get better at. And I understand that if I can build an audience and community here that like, that gives me more options. Like I'm obsessed with optionality. Like I want as much optionality as humanly possible. Like I don't want to be boxed in. I want to have, when you have optionality, you can kind of make different plays work. And I think that's like the magic of of doing what we're doing. It's like, I think most people would think like, oh, it's cool that Kip's doing like YouTube shows. Like I'm obsessed with doing a podcast. <laughs> like I want to be really good at this. Sure. It, it is a, it, it, in the short run is a terrible monetary investment of my time. In the long term, it is a, amazing life skill to like build and have and so like i think that is uh kind of the opportunity there it's like find something and really commit to it and double down on it and most people won't do 200 podcast episodes they won't write a thousand blog articles and if you do that you just kind of almost win by default i love that and and the benefits are like you you're happily employed at at a at a company you're an executive at a company but the Benefits from having this content is partnerships, employees, hiring, recruiting, brand. There, there are so many. There's so many benefits, and so it doesn't always have to be like, "Oh, you're going to go start this side hustle thing." I think creating content is. Uh, you see it in every niche. You could be a plumber, and you're a plumber, and you want to grow your business, and you just decide, "Yeah, yeah, I'm going to be the only plumber on LinkedIn." The, <laughs> and the, you would the, clean well, up. the most the most powerful thing that I don't think people talk about enough, Dave, is you never have a cold conversation ever again. Never. Right? And like you're seeing that now. Like 
anybody you talk to, you're like, oh, I want to, it's like, oh, I saw this episode you did. I have some questions, right? Yeah. And it's like, you never have like a, oh, hey, it's awkward. Nice to meet you. Uh, what are we going to talk about? It's like, no, somebody has consumed something you've done and like you always have a jumping off point and the, and the interaction, the connection is always better. Yeah. And, and but but I will say like there's no there's no shortcut to doing this. You've been <laughs> oh, you've been talking about marketing was. for for a long time and you you mentioned podcasting as a, as an example. I think today people will go to my LinkedIn and be like, "Oh, look at this guy. He just writes on LinkedIn. He's a LinkedIn thought leader." I started my first podcast in 2014. Nobody was talking about podcasting then. I didn't do it to build an audience. I didn't do it to get famous. I didn't do it to get rich. I did it because I was nerding out, listening to a podcast about startups called This Week in Startups that Jason Calacanis hosted. I was Mm -hmm. just getting into the startup scene in Boston, and I was like, man, there's like a buzzing startup scene here in Boston. Why is nobody talking about that? Somebody should start a podcast about these companies. And the guy who I was working for at the time was like, you should do it. And I was like, I don't know how to do it. He's like, fuck it. Go, go figure it out. <laughs> yeah, go figure it out, man. And that was the thing that changed. I met 60 P. I did 60 interviews that year. I met 60 different people. I met investors, advisors, future bosses, people I'm still connected with today, all because I was the only one who reached out and said, hey, I'm Dave. You've never heard of me, but I started a podcast about startups in Boston. Can I come to your office and interview you for an hour? And like the hit rate on that was 90%. And that that was the thing. So there's many variations of, of how you can fi- find a way to make the, this work. The very short answer is how you change your life. You just decide to, right? Like yeah. that's, you just decide to, and you start taking some action. And you yeah. just do, and you just make it part of your life. It's like and, and I you record, can't, I record two podcasts a week, and that's just what I do. And you can't worry, you can't worry about what people are going to think or what the reaction is going to be, or oh, all, no, all your you friends all. think you're a huge dork. Like it just, if you want to decide, if you want to make that change, you got to do it. Okay, last last one. All right, this is go. from Brooks. Brooks has a question that may open up an interesting angle. Brooks, I'll be Ooh. the judge of that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't get ahead of us, Brooks. Don't get ahead of us, Brooks. <laughs> the background is I run a solo content strategy and execution business. Been working with SaaS clients for years, and a main focus in the past few years has been working with B2B AI startups. I've worked with both mature and early stage companies. Question, unsurprisingly, I've noticed many early stagers are very engineering-led in markets that are volatile and supremely supremely bleeding edge. Since these startups are just building out the marketing function and are more focused on product development than even your typical SaaS company, this often leads to me spending a lot of time re-explaining basic, basic content principles. Any advice of how to, on how to effectively communicate the importance of foundational content and positioning to highly technical engineering-led organizations with loads of potential to capture early market share? Whew. That's, that, that, that was a big question. Are you tired from reading that? No, I just need a drink of water. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm tired from listening to that. Um, that was that was a big one. I right, it sounds like you're selling to someone who doesn't want what you're selling right now. For right? sure. Also, like, I don't know. I think that maybe the founders are right. <laughs> Like, I think it's just early and they should get product market fit. I totally yeah. So <laughs> and Brooks, let them go get product market fit. Right. Brooks, if you're if it's if you're a content strategy like content strategy, you're you're trying to sell content strategy to people who are not ready to 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 get content strategy. Now, there's two approaches. You could lose all your hair like me and beat the beat the drum so hard <laughs> trying to teach these founders about the importance of marketing. Could you do that? I believe you could. Is that going to be more effort than maybe going a little bit up market and redefining your I back to ICP if we as we've talked about a bunch? Why don't you go focus content strategy and execution on companies who already have product market fit? And could you be more successful and this be a less stressful business? What do you think about that, Kip? Uh, I agree with you. You know, you know how you ha- there's moments of your life that you just kind of remember like you were just sitting, like you're still sitting there, right? Is this and- one of them? Well, I mean, every conversation with you is one of them, Dave. <laughs> no, uh, I meant because of Brooks's question. <laughs> well, no, but but Brooks's book, Brooks's question jogged one for me, right? Okay, so okay, okay. A long time ago at HubSpot, we used to do in-person field trips. Now we do virtual field trips where we go and like, oh, you know, there's this topic, and we want we go talk to a bunch of people that on this topic we care about. We try to get a bunch of expertise in a dense period of time, kind of debrief and debate, and you learn you learn a bunch of stuff. Uh, it's one of the best things you could ever do. Pro tip out there. Um, we ha- we're having a conversation with this guy named George Hu, who was at the time the COO of Twilio. Before that, he was the COO of Salesforce.com. And he was just, he just sat down at the table and he's like, all right, 
Here's the first thing I need to know. Are you distribution constrained or are you product constrained? Mm. Is your product good enough to sell to people and you just can't get it into their hands? Or is your product lacking the features and functions it needs to really have the proper fit in the market? And like, you're just like, oh, geez, that is just like the perfect question. And this is the perfect question for any of these startups that you're working with out there. It's like, if they're distribution constrained, then you're selling them the thing they need. Yeah. If they are product constrained, then you're not selling them the thing they need. The thing they need is focused to go get the product where it needs to be. I just, and I, I know feel- there are a bunch of people who are going to be like, well, but you got to do the two in parallel. And, you know, you can't just wait till the product's ready. And I'm like, nah, largely you can. Right. That's I, This is so good because this is like re- rewind all the marketing problems back to these like first principle Correct. type things. Don't you feel like, though, if you in a service type business... Isn't it always going to be better to just be super niche, like soup, like just niches, niche as far down as you can to build the type of business that you want? Well, well, niche and very opinionated. I will tell you, every the best service operators I've ever worked with or I've hired or whatever are always like, this is exactly who I work with. Do you meet these criteria? Because if not, <laughs> I don't want to work with you. Yeah, to- totally. Right? Like, think about it. Like, that is like, they're totally. like, look, I work with these types of companies at this very specific stage. Are you at this stage? Here's the 20 questions I'm going to ask you to make sure I believe you are at that specific stage. Yeah. And you know what? It works. <laughs> right. It works. They they qualify they qualify you and they're like, oh, yes. do you Yeah, can, you're not can qualifying you, them. They're no, qualifying you. Can you pass go? But you know why? Those those are smart seasoned people because they've been burned. Yes. They have run an agency and tried to appeal to 15 different clients and they're like, this sucks. Like <laughs> And I talked to somebody yesterday, and on the surface, I thought he was an ABM consultant. He's like, nope, I'm not an ABM consultant. I do LinkedIn ads for B2B SaaS companies at this stage. I'm like, you're going to be successful. Like, get, yes. So so we gave, we gave a bunch of advice there. Focus on who you're selling to, and be sure that, that they're, when you're selling to them, that they're distribution constrained, not product constrained. They don't need to go and actually work on that product. Now, Excellent. Dave, I have, a que- I have a question for you. I, okay. I have a couple questions before we, we finish in our last like sure. five minutes here. Sure. The first is, you know, I'm getting, we're getting ready to have our team kick off. Uh, and and we got a couple of them over the next couple of weeks. And I was like thinking about everything I was going to talk with my team about. And one of the things is like, man, you know what? It's just really fun and exciting to be a marketer now. And like the last couple of years, it wasn't that fun and exciting to be a marketer. And like, I don't know, I'm like feeling very happy, very excited. Then I saw you had a tweet and you were like, I'm having fun. I didn't realize I wasn't having fun, but I'm having fun now. Why are you having fun? Like, why are we both so happy and having fun? Like, what, what, what's, what's, what's happening out there, you think? For me, one of the things was just changing my mindset and playing Ooh, offense like instead of playing defense. I was a little bit like, I'm not sure who I am. I'm not sure what I want to be. And I, I'm not sure what what thing I want to go after. And then one day I woke up and I'm like, stop being a moron. Don't chase new things, <laughs> right? <laughs> like to, to Craig. Craig, Craig wanted to chase new channels. And you're like, double down on what's working. And so I looked at what's working at this point in my life. And that thing is Exit 5. And that thing is building this B2B media company. And I was like, man, I don't want to talk about B2B marketing forever. But what's fun is I decided to go all in, hire a team. It's changed my view. I'm like, oh, no, I'm now an operator. I'm not the B2B marketing guy. I get to like find creative yes. ways to grow that business. And once I made that change, it was like a, a magnet that just attracted all these interesting people. I'm on with you. I talk about marketing with you. Like, I wasn't talking to people that I looked up to or want to be peer group with or want to be peers within a while. And I was just kind of feeling like, man, what I'm doing is lame. But then like, I talked to you, I talked to some other people that, that, that I'm close within the space. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. I got that energy again. I think you need to like get out. It's like when you haven't been working out in a while and all of a sudden you go to like a, a, a a soul cycle class or you do something, you go to Barry's boot camp. You're like, yeah, there's 30 other people here of the same goals and same mission (laughs) as me. Like I'm fired up again. So that helped me big time. That That's a big thing. It's not a marketing tactic. It's just like just being around other people with shared goals and who want to want to do the same things are going to push you. I, I found myself a peer group again that kind of pushed me from, from kind of stale ways of thinking. And then the third piece of this is like... A- <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's AI. <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry. No, well, that's part. Yeah. That's part of why I'm excited is because the world is changing. Like, yes. my Vision Pro gets dropped off in like an hour or two, and like, <laughs> I'm super excited. It's the first thing that yeah. I've spent money on in like 
a long time, but I'm like deeply excited yeah. to like use. And like, I know it's going to be bad in a bunch of ways and it's going to be clunky in a bunch of ways, but like it, the, the difference and the interesting aspect of it is like, it's wild. Right. And yes. like that to me is super exciting. And I think in your answer, you actually gave the best advice of the entire show, which was be decisive. Yeah. Like if you took anything away, like a theme of, of all the questions you gathered from the community was indecision, was like lack of confidence and indecision, right? If you yeah. literally just write down, what am I unsure about? And you make a decision, right? Like, you know, there's like this old cheesy quote, I think it's like a Dr. Phil quote or something where it was like, there are no right decisions. There are decisions you make right. Yeah. And that is essentially... 100 percent true you just if you make a decision to commit to it it will be the right decision whether it actually was or not oh, it's so good I, I just had a question from somebody the other day and they're like hey i have a i have a brand naming question like i'm really torn between this name and this name and i'm like please just pick <laughs> it one does and not matter go. does just not pick matter something. the name is what it becomes the name is what you're going to make it and if this is the thing that's blocking you from getting started like you're you need to just you need to just go i love that indecision because like we've talked about also there's so many ways to win and so many ways to be dis to be successful you need to go marching down that path and like just remove all the other variables i struggle personally when there's like a hundred options. I don't like that. It's like when no. I go to the doctor, I like when the doctor's like, this is wrong with you, do this thing specifically. I don't <laughs> like when they're like, well, you could do this and you could do that. I like I like that decisiveness. I think that's great advice, Kip. Um, on AI though, yeah. we yeah, don't like, get- I gotta get my last word we don't in on get AI. I just think we don't get opportunities like this often if you're into business and marketing and sales and the fundamental shift that's happening, like, this is the get with it or get lost opportunity. Well, no, no, Dave. I'm going. I'm going to. I'm going to blow your mind for a minute okay, because blow this it. is how blow what it. I've been. This is what I've been thinking about. If you think of when we got into the this game in the early 2000s, mid mid 2000s, it's easy to be like, oh, it was social media, or oh, it was SEO. It was. We had search engines come to power. We had social networks created. We had broadband internet. Right. That was cheap and wi widely accessible. Mobile. We had cloud computing. We had this thing called the smartphone and the iPhone and the Android come. Like we had all of these shifts that just basically transformed the next 10 to 15 years. That's what's happening right now. It's not just AI. Like think about Starlink. You can now get fi faster than fiber internet in the middle of the most remote part of the world. <laughs> this is real. Like, that's My bananas. So so you know, you know I'm up in Vermont. My in-laws lived in the woods, and for the 10 years of dating my wife. They literally would go to her house and there was no service. Of course. They have faster internet than I do now. Yes. But, but like if you – and think about the spatial computing, AR, VR space. You think about all of these trends, even some of the decentralized technologies. Like I don't think crypto is going to ever be main mainstream, but some of those technologies will become mainstream. And like we are about to surf a new 15-year wave. And if you pick any part of it, and have some conviction and invest time, you are going to be successful just as it grows and matures. So AI, yes, but it's like AI is only a part of the opportunity that like we're actually sitting on right now. Damn it, Kip. I'm all fired up again. I, ah, what am I going to do? This, this is a Friday. I gotta go. I have 100 new ideas already. <laughs> That's great. Go, you know, go ski. Can't, we can't play golf yet. We'll play golf in a couple months. It'll, okay. it'll, it'll be great. All right. Um, Thank you to the Exit 5 community, first of all. And if you haven't checked it out, go check out Exit 5. We'll drop a note in the show description. Please please leave us comments. If you have questions, drop them in the YouTube. If there's enough questions, Dave and I will do an Encore episode. And Dave, thanks for taking some time away from the Exit 5 fam and community to come join us on Marketing Against the Green today. Thanks, Kip. To my point about hanging out with people that give me energy, when you asked me to come on, I was like, got to make sure I'm here for that. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm a first time caller, long time listener of this show, and I'm excited to, something to, ha something, excited to listen to my own voice in a future episode. <laughs> Love it, man. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody. See you on the next show. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history, calls, support tickets, emails, and... Here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot. Grow better.